The next speaker is Antoinette Latouf, who, who, as we all know, has been attacked by our money. The ABC is ours, so they say. We own the ABC, so they say. But the reality of it is the ABC is owned by foreign interests. These are not our people anymore. We've got to wrestle back the ABC, we've got to wrestle back our government, and let's listen to the wonderful, beautiful Antoinette. Thank you. different event than what I'd signed up to a few weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. Initially we were all coming together to yes, celebrate in a way Julian's 53rd birthday. How many people in this room thought we'd be celebrating his release as well? No! Yeah! Oh there's one! Oh it's good to have one optimist in the room. Uh, for those who don't know me, I shot to international fame for yes. being sacked. That's a strange thing to put on my CV. Uh, but after sharing a Human Rights Watch post about Gaza and starvation being used as a tool of war, my employment with the ABC came to an end and it is now the subject of two court cases. Um, and what's been revealed subsequently is uh, two very active WhatsApp groups, Lawyers for Israel and Jewish creatives and academics who sought to get me out of the building and it seemed that they had success. They've got the power. And I think a lot of people, it's really interesting and I can't speak for Julie and I can only speak for myself to say that as journalists and publishers and editors, we're in the business of telling stories and it's really strange when you become the story because we don't set out to become the story or I know I certainly didn't set out to become a poster girl for press freedom or a poster girl for human rights but somehow you sometimes find yourself in this circumstance. Often Julian has been described as brave, um, I've been described as brave and I want to unpack what it is to be brave because the, the technical definition is to you know, to go ahead and do something, to be courageous, even though you know that there can be consequences. And I don't know, I guess for me, it's like knowing 7,000% it's gonna hurt, but doing it anyway, because it's more important that your pain isn't as important as what it sheds light on. And I guess that's where we found ourselves in, in 2024, that it's become brave to talk about human rights? Like, what, what? where did we go wrong that it's become brave to care about journalists being killed? It's become brave to say, hey, I don't think starving children to death is okay. I think we live in a bit of a dystopian world when that is considered brave, when standing up and saying that that is not okay is somehow a form of bravery. I also think the word bravery has been cheapened. When Ben Robert Smith was given the Victoria Cross, and so I just think that we need to reclaim what it means to be brave. Ben Robert Smith isn't brave, and I don't think me saying, hey, let's not starve Palestinians to death should be brave. Something has shifted, the equilibrium is wrong, and it's really, and, it, and it, it, that's what keeps me up at night. I don't want to be called brave, I certainly don't want Ben Robert Smith to be called brave, and I, I, I just think we can't take our institutions like the media for granted and the important role it plays. I was really hardened to see the photograph of Julian hugging Stella. I think everybody was moved by that. But then I was also very swiftly disheartened to think how many years did it take? How many years did it take for Julian to get his freedom? And a lot of my media peers have spent a lot of time going, Oh, but is he technically a journalist? He didn't go to journalism school. He was a publisher. Did he follow? Did he follow journalism code of ethics? If we're to apply, if we are to apply, did a journalist apply the journalism code of ethics? Ethics. <laughs> ethics. Then, how much of what Murdoch Media puts out follows the journalism code of ethics? If, if that is our litmus test of what is considered a journalist and what is in the public interest, then there are serious questions to be asked about the rest of the media. In terms of who is brave, and I want to take the label of, of brave journalist away from me, 109 Palestinian journalists have been killed. 
they turn up every day knowing that they're sharing truth to the world, they're bypassing traditional media, getting stories. Many don't make it to the end of the day. They are brave. 109 have been killed, the most amount of journalists killed in a single conflict since the Committee to Protect Journalists formed in 1992. 50 have been arrested, others have gone missing. That is bravery. That is the sort of fearless journalism that we need. Not those sitting writing op-eds about, about Assange and about public interest and how much public interest and you know whether or not publishing is journalism. I'm like, we need to take, we need to look at what the sacrifices journalists in Gaza have made. We also need to look at the deafening silence amongst journalists in the media here who don't seem to be up in arms about the fact that 110 of their peers have been killed. Yeah. Don't seem to be too concerned. Do they know their names? Where are the memorials? Where are the hashtags? Yeah. Yeah. And so. Today we celebrate Assange, and I think that's an enormous win, but we have to continue to fight for the freedoms and basic human rights that we know are being stripped of Palestinians every day for the past 75 years. A lot of people also say to me, why would you want to go back and work at the ABC? Um, I believe a fair, robust, representative, public broadcaster is worth fighting for. It is yes. ours. Yes. It is essential in a democracy. It, does, it shouldn't bow to political pressure. It shouldn't bow to lobby groups. It needs to tell our stories. It needs to be impartial and independent. It needs to speak truth to power without any fear or any favour. And so that is why I am continuing my case. And that is why I hope to be back on the airways. People sound crazy. People are like, why would you go back there? If we all get bullied into silence, I don't think our democracy prospers. Um, and so I'm honoured to be here tonight to celebrate Assange's return home, but also to remember who the real heroes are and to remember the bravery of journalists in Gaza. Antoinette Latouf, it's a pleasure to meet you here tonight. Yeah, good to meet you. And let's explain to people why we are here in St Kilda, this club. Yeah, it's interesting because when I first got approached to speak at this event, it was, yes, to celebrate Julian Assange's 53rd birthday, but it was in very different circumstances because at that time Julian was still in prison and so yeah, it was a celebration but really to bring people together to talk about the importance of press freedom. From the date of this being organised to this evening things have obviously changed. Assange is now on Australian soil and finally has freedom after more than a decade so the mood in the room is very different to what it would have been uh, had that not happened. Yeah, so, so what do you think about what's being written about Julian Assange in the papers at the moment? Yeah, look, I think it's really interesting and it's really mixed. I think overwhelmingly most people can recognise that it's almost what, 14 years, that's far too much for what he's had to endure and the circumstances in which he's had to endure it. What's peculiar and curious is all of these questions of is was he really a journalist is this a win for for press freedom and then some people who I otherwise respect and whose journalism I look to and agree with have spent a whole lot of time dissecting was he really a journalist is this really press freedom and saying well, what about journalism ethics and I think well if we look at most of the tabloid media and if you go to apply that prism of are they abiding by a journalism code of ethics about sources and curating and doing things that may make people unsafe then I think it's safe to say that the majority or a huge amount of journalists in Australia probably couldn't be classified journalists because they don't abide by the journalism code of ethics so I think making the focus about whether he was a journalist rather than what he exposed and the war crimes or the alleged war crimes that he exposed with WikiLeaks, particularly at a time when we are seeing war crimes happening by the hour in Gaza, I think that should be the conversation and not dissecting whether he's a journalism hero or not. Another target of abuse, one could argue that it is abuse, has been Fatima Payman. Mm. She's really suffering at the moment. She's being locked out of the caucus and simply for a vote of conscience, one might say. What do you think about this kind of 
activity. My greatest observation here is it's interesting how the Labour Party is able to demonstrate that it can swiftly act and exile and sanction somebody, so to speak, when they break a rule. And in this case, Fatima's rule breaking was crossing the floor. And so given that it's demonstrated it can do this, why won't it sanction and exile Israel, which is breaking humanitarian, international law after international law. So it shows that the Labour Party can care about the rule of law, but it applies it selectively, and it's applied it against the first hijabi Muslim senator. And I think that speaks volumes about the Labour Party. Yes. Senator John F. Kennedy, before he became president, wrote a book that every school child my age read. It was called Profiles in Courage. It was about members of the US Congress who spoke out from their own hearts about certain issues that went against their party, went against popular opinion because they thought it was right. And here, in my view, what I'm seeing in Parliament with Fatima Payman is profiles in cowardice. How could it be that on an issue such as this, recognizing Palestine, from a, a woman clearly who this is an important issue to, that they could act in this way. What are the rules that permit a party to punish someone for not voting with them? I, it happens all the time in other parliaments and legislatures that you vote with the other side. It happens. Yeah. You know, I think it calls into question whether that rule is outdated. The Liberal Party doesn't explicitly state that you can't cross the floor. And so it might be a good time for the Labour Party to consider whether this rule is fit for purpose, given that they do want diverse representatives in Parliament. And so do you have the mechanisms in place to ensure that they can express their views and represent their communities and their constituents? I find it interesting that Peter Dutton, the leader of the opposition, uh, backed the Prime Minister in calling for Julian Assange to be returned home. And now that he's here, Assange, they're just making politics out of this by attacking Albanese for doing anything to help Assange come back. How could you explain this? I haven't paid too much attention to what Dutton has said. I, I was heartened at first to hear that both Abbott and Dutton were in agreement that what Julian Assange had endured had gone on for too long and that it was time to see him come home. Does it surprise me that he's become more adversarial and polarising? No, it's pretty much on brand for Peter Dutton. What about Penny Wong? She made a statement that it sounded like a warning to Julian Assange. We have laws in Australia against uh, classified information being. She didn't say leaked or published, but there were all secrecy laws and she seemed to want to impose them. You know about the statement? I do, do but I do. I also think credit where it's due. I know that um, Penny Wong, Kevin Rudd and Anthony Albanese worked really hard to negotiate the terms of Assange's release. And so in this case, I'm going to say credit where it's due and they've made what seemed impossible happen. Okay. Now, if you look at the deal, they dropped every charge except the only one that they could ever get him on from the very beginning, which was this technical uh, violation of the Espionage Act because he had unauthorized possession and he had unauthorized dissemination, classified information. But that, as Julian himself said in the courtroom in Saipan, is unconstitutional because he believed the First Amendment protected him on that. This is the main issue for us now, is how to challenge the Espionage Act to remove that section, which clearly uh, is not applied only to government officials who sign non-disclosure agreements, but to anyone in the world. So uh, what was your feeling about the deal that uh, Julian... You know, I'm probably not going to comment on that because I don't know. All the details of the yeah. deal hasn't come out, so I'm not, to be honest, I won't comment on that because I'm okay. not informed. We'll, that's send okay. you, we'll send you a copy of I'll the send you three. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So I, I probably won't. I probably, okay. I prefer not to comment when I don't know. Well, one okay. of the problems for us is that it has become very, very similar. Uh, we've been told by Senator David Shoebridge that there are over 300 laws about secrecy, keeping information yes. secret. Yes. And this is a real problem. Yeah, I can speak more broadly. We've seen in the past 10 years, be it the strengthening of whistleblower penalties uh, and our defamation laws, that it's increasingly hard 
to be a journalist, to be a journalist that is protected, to do their craft or to work with a source, an important whistleblower source. And so that's also seen Australia drop uh, at least 10 points in the World Press Freedom Index that we used to be in the top 20. We now sit at about 35, I believe, in the latest Reporters Without Borders. And so these so-called laws to protect um, national security or national interests are actually impinging on press freedom.